you wanted the best, you've got the best podcast. The hottest, hottest. podcast in the world. In the world. The Chris Voss Show, the preeminent podcast with guests so smart you may experience serious brain bleed. The CEOs, authors, thought leaders, visionaries, and motivators. Get ready, get ready. Strap yourself in. Keep your hands, arms, and legs inside the vehicle at all times because you're about to go on a monster education roller coaster with your brain. Now, here's your host. Chris Voss. Hi, folks. It's Voss here from the Chris Voss Show dot com. There you go, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the show. Certainly appreciate you guys being here. As always, the Chris Voss Show is the family that loves you but doesn't judge you. At least not as harshly as the rest of your family, because most of them never liked you anyway. And that's kind of how families go. You, what's the old saying? You can't pick your family. The great thing about the Chris Voss Show is you can pick your family, and we pretty much love you as a whole, unless you're evil. If you're there in the back, the half the reason we do the show is to teach you how to be a better human being. So don't be evil, and the show is kind of here for, I think, some of the evil people. So work on it. Damn it. Now if we can just get Putin to start watching the show. We have the most amazing guests on the show, the Pulitzer Prize winners, the CEOs, the billionaires, the famous authors that bring you all their data. They know everything. They've studied it. They've spent 10,000, 100,000 of hours studying what they're studying. They bring you the stories to improve the quality of your life and everything else. For further show to your family, friends, and relatives, go to goodreads.com, Fortress Chris Voss, LinkedIn.com, Fortress Chris Voss, Chris Voss 1 on the TikTok and E and all those crazy places on the internet. Today we have another amazing gentleman on the show. His book just came out May 7th, 2024. It's called Everything is Predictable, How Bayesian Statistics Explain Our World. Tom Chivers is on the show with us today. And I'm going to be asking if he, he can help me with that data on with his book on dating. <laughs> he is the author and award-winning science writer at Semaphore. His writing has appeared in The Times in London, The Guardian, New Scientist, Wired, CNN, and more. His books include Everything is Predictable, The Rationalist Guide to the Galaxy, and How to Read Numbers. We need to get more people doing that for math. Welcome to the show. How are you, sir? I'm very well. Thanks for having me. Thanks for coming. We really appreciate it. Give us your dot coms. Where can people find you on the interwebs? Tom Chivers. Does there, I actually have got TomChivers.com, but I probably should update that because I haven't for a while and it's out there. But you can find my work at Semaphore.com where I write their daily newsletter. And you can find me, obviously, at, it's not called Twitter anymore, is it? Damn it. Well, X.com. It. Just, just keep calling it Twitter. What everyone does. It really annoys me. Twitter.com slash Tom Chivers. I am yeah. there. Trust me, they'll change the name back in bankruptcy. I hope so. Uh, <laughs> it's next week sometime. So welcome to the show, Tom. Congratulations on the new book. Give us a 30,000 overview of what's inside this. Right. Okay. So thanks for the congratulations. The book is about this very simple equation called Bayes' theorem, which was invented or developed or discovered or whatever you want, whatever word you want to use by this. It was a, it was a clergyman, a, a, a sort of hobbyist, hobbyist mathematician from the 18th century, a guy called Thomas Bayes. And it is, it's just literally, it's one, it's one line of, of, of equation. It is the just maths, just multiplication, division stuff my like eight year old daughter could do, mm. but it explains, I would say a decent chunk of everything. Like it, it is, it is the, it is the maths of prediction. Basically it is the maths of how we, how, when we get new information, how we integrate that information with the information we already have and can therefore, and therefore sort of predict the world. Like, so we, I, yeah, I mean, so it, it is absolutely crucial in medicine and science. It is, it is the basis of all like decision theory and how we, how, you know, how decisions and are made under uncertainty. It is, it, it is a pretty, I, I would say it can describe pretty effectively how the human brain works. It's, it's a really, it's the most, I would say it's the most important one line equation that is possible to, to know. Oh. So everything in this world kind of has a mathematical sort of segment that seems to be mm. there's math in the universe. Whoever created the universe is a giant nerd with a pocket. Yes. <laughs> does, can I, can I use your book to help me win the lottery or how does, is, how is that different? I think you can use the book to say that you're very unlikely to win the lottery, but you can, you can use the book to, sorry to pour cold water on that one. Damn. But you know, keep trying, keep trying. Right. But no, you can use the book, I think to. <laughs> give you an interesting perspective on how how decisions are made and that, and I hope help you make help make better decisions right and and to make a better sort of uh, stabs at grasping how the world works and sort of understanding it because I think like the the fundamental insight of Bayes theorem is that we 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 make these predictions all the time like of I don't know is the shop gonna have 
beer when I get there to pick it up. You know, mm. that's and and we and we update that that those predictions with new information when we get it. If I look on the website and it's got it, and they, what what Bayes theorem does is describe is describe the maths of how we do how we do that or the idealized form of it. Mm. But the and obviously we can't really predict everything. We don't. We can't. We can't. We can't really know all the information in the world. But we can use this as a sort of idealized form of it. But more importantly, I think the insight for us as individuals is that we don't need to have. We don't need to say this thing is true or not true, or this thing will happen or won't happen. We can say I think it is this likely that this thing is true, or this likely that something is going to happen, and then we can update away from those best guesses that are subjective best guesses with new information and, and and never have to sort of doggedly defend i believe this thing i so you know and we can sway with new information as it comes in and i think that's mm. some from a sort of personal you know news you can use sort of angle that's the biggest insight of the book and of bayes theorem is that we don't need to be dogmatic about things we can update with new information and make prob probabilistic judgment there you go. So I'm an Oakland Raiders fan, technically Los Angeles Raiders now. Can I figure? Can I use this to figure out when we're going to win the next Super Bowl? You can. Yes, you can. You, you sort of can. Really? I mean, wow. I as in right. You have I, I, how many? How many teams are there in the NFL total? I mean, there's. there's uh, there, I, I'm not an expert on this stuff. Yeah, you know, there's 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 know. different conferences, aren't there? Yeah. Without any information, prior information. Let's let's say there's 25 teams. I don't know. I just totally pulled that, that number that out of my ass. Sounds about right. 20, yeah. 26. Um, yeah. Something like that. There's that, or in the in the British in the English Premier League, there's 20 soccer teams. So if you didn't have any more information than that, your prior probability of any given team winning in a given year is one in 20, right? It's 5%. Mm -hmm. um, if I got that right, yes, 5%. And, uh, but then you get more information. You get who won it last year and it's mm -hmm. Man City. I don't know who won the Super Bowl. Was it, was it, was it Kansas City Chiefs? Or did I just yes. get confused with, yeah. Yes. See, yeah. The only reason I know that is because I know who Taylor Swift is going out with, which is just <laughs> embarrassing. That's an embarrassing reason to know that. Yeah. I know that's uh, not very manly, my friend. No, I know. <laughs> yeah, I'm a real man. Definitely watch football all the time. Yes. No, no, I, I actually do watch <laughs> English football, and yeah, I, so, so it's a there different thing. They, they throw the ball over there, don't they? Is that the way it works? Yeah, yeah. That, that's uh, that they, you get told off for it, but you know people do. It. <laughs> but yeah, the, but so with you know that's your prior probability. That is your oh. base rate of one in five, one in twenty chances. Your prior probability of how likely any given team is. But then you update it. Who won it last year? And you think well, that should update. That should move me towards thinking that team is more likely than the team that just got promoted to the league or the team that came bot dead last in the conference, whatever, last mm -hmm. year, you know? And that, so my prior probability is that. Then you can update it more. Has some, they brought in new players? Have they brought in, you know, have any of their players got older or got past their best? Have they sold, you know, has one, other teams come in and got, stolen some of their best players? Has someone got mm -hmm. an injury? And you can update away from your initial prior, your initial prior with this new information. So yes, it can. I, I would imagine that the team that won the Super Bowl last year is more likely than a, than a randomly selected team to win the mm -hmm. Super Bowl this year. I don't know how often teams defend it, but that, yeah. but that, you know. So I would say that Kansas City Chiefs are more likely to win it than I don't know the Miami Dolphins still from Miami. <laughs> I, 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 they're I still know. they're still in Miami, but most high school teams can beat them. Yeah, um, I mean that's my. So I, could, I picked a go to no, you're, yeah. yeah, you're 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 right. The you're you're right. The 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 teams that are have built themselves. To a perfection of 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 great players and they, that have mastered the game, they do tend to hold on. You know, like the Patriots were an extraordinary run. Kansas City Chiefs, I think they won the year before or the year before. And I think they were in the playoffs two years prior, but they won the last year. So they tend to you you tend to have a, a team that goes through you know rebuild and then eventually peaks, and just everybody's firing on all cylinders. Yeah. And then there is a bit of luck to it too, of course. Because yeah, you're, because you're two of the top-rated teams. But the mindset of you know they've studied the mindset of when you go into the Super Bowl and the people that have been there before aren't as jacked up and nervous and have the jitters of mm. nerves so much as the new person that shows up, and that's a factor. So the new people that usually show up in the Super Bowl for the first time, it's like going on stage for the first time, even though you've been in arenas. You know, you you're at the show show. Hmm. And uh, you know you've got you've got millions of people watching that don't normally watch normal games. Yeah, and, you know you're you realize you're at the pinnacle of your career. You're like I've spent my whole life working for this, and it's very easy to you, you know you can use the analogy fumble the ball as it were. Yeah, because as as most of us do when you work really hard and you reach the pinnacle of what you've worked all your life for, sometimes you're 
you're you, you have a little trouble staying at that level. Yeah. So I want to get into your other book too. That we'll circle back to the AI stuff because we love talking about AI. So mm. those who are listening, we're going to talk a little bit about that later on the show. Tell us a little bit about yourself because people like to get to know the author. What 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 was your upbringing? What made you want to become a journalist and inspired you to write, et cetera? When did you kind of know you were becoming a writer? I don't know. I, I in my I I I didn't have, like I. I became a journalist after sort of not knowing what else to do. I think that I, I, I left university. I did a philosophy at university, because, which is just your classic. I don't know what I'm doing with my life. It was really interesting, but I just want to, and, and then I did more. I still, I didn't know what else I was doing. So I carried on doing philosophy at university when I finished it. And mm. then eventually realized I just had to go and get a proper job. And I was, I'd sort of like, by that stage, I'd realized I was good at, you know, the, the best thing about being at university was writing the essays. I was good at that. I was, you know, I, I would make them funny, which was, is not a common theme of undergraduate philosophy essays, I don't think. And I was—I realized I was, I was enjoying it. And so then when I came out of what turned out to be an abortive attempt at doing a PhD, I managed to get a couple of weeks work experience at an English national newspaper, a British national newspaper called The Telegraph, and managed to short answer, not screw that up, you know, managed to not, not balls it up for a couple of weeks. They started giving me a couple of shifts, you know, and, and, and I've always, I've always been interested in, in science. So once I had my foot in the door, I just tried to get to, to write the sciencey stories, learned more about it. Didn't really understand half the stuff I was writing, but you know, 15, whatever it is. Oh Jesus. What year is it? 17 years later, I've, you know, I've been doing it long enough that I've, I've picked up enough to picked up the, the sort of swing of it. But yeah, so it was, it was just, it was a combination of I vaguely like writing and I have a big enough ego that I want to tell people what I think. And, ah. you know, narcissism is important. Uh, I find. Yeah. Powerful driver. Right. Yeah. 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 <laughs> traits really help. Very helpful. Very helpful. Yeah. I, I think I could use a bit more disagreeability. Actually. I think that on, on the, on the dark triads, I, I tell you what, do you, have you heard of an author called Terry Pratchett? Uh, no. Oh, anyway, a famous British author. I met him and interviewed him. He was when before he died in 2013, and he had been a journalist. And, and I, I, he was he was dying at the time. He had a, a form of port dementia, which was going to kill him eventually. And he and I remember changing the subject away from his away from his brain, you know, the fact that he was going to die, basically. And he was like, because I couldn't stand it anymore. You know? And he just said, you're too nice. You're too nice to be a journalist. But I remember that. I remember that. I've still got that in my Twitter bio. Too too nice to be a journalist, which I thought was... Um, too nice to be a journalist. I like yeah. that. Mm. You know, we, we've had people on the show that that when they made the major news, they the, the news would go for the most salacious part. So I'll give you an example. Peter Strzok, when he came on the show, he he was an FBI agent who was heading the Clinton and Trump investigation. And one, he and a very integral guy, but he made, you know, one mistake that a lot of guys make in their in their in their middle ages is they'll they'll an affair. Yeah. And so he was texting, you know, someone in the end, it was with someone at work, but you know, all the news could talk about was not about how my democracy was under assault and the, the data that he had and, 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 you know, what he was finding that our, you know, democracy was under attack. You, do you need me to explain a democracy to you? Cause you guys are over there in England. Oh, excuse me. How, excuse me. How dare you? No, We've had a democracy hundreds of years longer than you, pal. That's true. I'm yeah. just giving you shit, you know. You've got, yeah, I know. It's fine. You got the whole monarchy thing. And, and I mean, I'm just proud of you guys. You guys have kept a someone at 10 Downing Street for like at least three months. So I, I yeah, but that. must be getting on for a year now. But he's going to get booted out pretty soon. It's going to be brutal. Uh, okay. It's going to be absolutely For a while brutal. there, though, you guys are just, uh, I don't know, it was a temporary job for a while. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but at least like you got your... At least you get rid of your version of Donald Trump. That was good. We had a, we had a variety of things every six weeks for a while. It was complicated. Yeah, it was. Yeah. And I was like, I was like, can't they get a guy who can comb his hair? And <laughs> 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 yeah, he was. He was. I mean, he was. He was. He was good value. He was like. He was. Uh, he was. He was. He was. He was, uh, he was box office. But he was. Uh, yeah. yeah. He was he, no he, Churchill. He, not, let's put it yes, that way. Yeah. Exactly. He wanted to be. <laughs> anyway, I shouldn't get political. But yes. Yeah. That, that was, well, that was an interesting time. Fun. We're just not going. Yeah. I lost my segue though. Whatever I was going into. But I don't know. What I I completely lost my. Segue. Sorry. <laughs> I was, I, I've, I've, no, I've, we were having yeah. fun. That's what we do on the show. If I remember getting back to it, it'll it'll usually come back to me. You know, with the with this Bayesian. Let's get back to your book with the Bayesian yeah. gentleman. Tell us a little bit more about this guy. Who is who he is? When did he live? Why should we trust him? <laughs> so, we don't actually know when he was born. We know with we know he was born seventeen hundred or seventeen oh one because he was 
because he was a what's a, actually what in England we call a nonconformist preacher, as in he was not a follower of the Church of England. But since the entirety of the United States was essentially founded on nonconformist preachers who ran away from England so they could go and set up their own things over there, you could probably just call them preachers. But yeah, he was he was a he was a vicar or a, a clergyman, and he was he in his spare time he was this massive nerd. He was a I mean he just he was constantly writing. Like I think you know, at that time, the way his biographer told told me, you know, nowadays nowadays rich people, if they have leisure, they might get involved in a sports team or something like that. You know, buy a sports team. At that time, if you were a rich guy, which he was, he had came from family money, and you have an undemanding job like being a clergyman in a small town outside London somewhere, then you you get into science as a hobby. And he was part of the whole, you know, this is the whole pre-Victorian times, but in those days, there was a lot of people just sending letters to each other arguing about maths problems or you know science this you know a hundred years later darwin would be doing the same thing mm. writing letters to his hundreds of friends all across europe arguing about what you know the shape of pigeons feet or whatever you know and so it was that sort of so he was just and he got involved with this this guy called lord stanhope who was a self massive massive nerd who just went around sort of supporting interesting mathematicians we found and uh, you know he did a couple of things he wrote a big a big piece for a big sort of paper defending god because defending against against the problem of evil which philosophy graduates might remember you know how how come there's evil in the world if god is perfect and wants us all to be happy that sort of stuff uh-huh. he wrote yeah he wrote a big thing defending newton from an attack by a, about a, by the bishop berkeley but the thing he's remembered for is one he's also uh, it was one paper one paper which was was published after he's, he died called the doc, what was it a something on the doctrine of chances a, a treatise on the doctrine of chances i should remember the name of it that's not quite right but anyway and it was about how do we so i'm going to get a bit technical here and if you and stop me if i'm being boring but i think oh. it's it's i think I, hopefully hopefully it's not right normally when we do probability at school and things like that we do you know we might say how likely am i to see three sixes on three dice something like that you know or how likely am i to draw a royal flush you know, from a deck of cards, that sort of thing. We crabs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. We we work out we work out how likely we are to see some result, right? Given mm-hmm. the hypothesis that there this deck of cards is complete or that the dice are fair or whatever, you know. So how likely are we to see event, how likely to see data given this hypothesis? Mm-hmm. But if we're doing statistics in the in the world, right? So that's called sampling probability. But if we're doing statistics in the world to find stuff out. What we want to know is how, you know, like I, I want to do a study into, uh, I don't know, a COVID vaccine, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and I get, and I, and I see some results. Say I see, um, you know, the, in the, in the placebo arm, only one per 10 people get COVID and in the, in the real vaccine arm, ten, only one person does. We don't, you know, I can tell you how likely I would be to see that result given the hypothesis that the vaccine doesn't work. You know, there were chances that it would be a coincidence in that situation. But what we couldn't, can't do with that sort of probability, we can't say how likely it is that the vaccine works, and that's actually what we care about, right? When statisticians yeah. do, it, we, we're not just saying, oh, I could, we, we, you know, we don't really want to work out how likely we are to see three sixes on a three dice. That's easy and trivial. It's one in two hundred and sixteen, and you can work <laughs> it out, and yeah, it's fine. But if what you want to say is how likely, given this new information that I have, is my hypothesis to be true? So what Bayes did was after you know and people have been arguing about this stuff for a couple of hundred years by the time he came along oh, really? what he did was re- was describe why how we do that and it's mm. uh, and the what he realized was that you need to have you, you need to have what we call a prior probability so like when we were talking earlier on when we were talking earlier on about the probability that the Kansas Chiefs Kansas City Chiefs would win you know given out of 1 in 20 chance where that that that's our prior probability and we need to have that before we can then say and now given the new information that they've signed this player. What's you know what? How likely are they now? That so you need to have a a, a best guess before you go into it. That was his big insight. Mm-hmm. The reason that was controversial and remains controversial now, three hundred years. You know, how, what what year are we in again? Oh god, I can't remember. Yeah, two thousand twenty four. Yeah, so we're we're pushing three hundred years on now, and it's still really controversial because that is it's subjective. I say my best guess of how likely that my COVID vaccine is to work. Whatever. It's my best guess. There's not there's not some fact out in the world. It is just a subjective guess. And that some people really hate that. Really, really hate it. Because they're sort of saying all statistics are just squishy, best guess, subjective. There's no, it's not an objective fact about the universe. But that is the only without those without those priors, you cannot use statistics to say how likely something is. You can only say how likely some we are to see these statistics given a hypothesis, for example, that there is no effect. Does that is that is that comprehensible? It's, it's, yeah. It's, uh, yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, pro the probability, you know, one of the favorite sayings I always have is character is destiny, mm. history mm. is destiny. You know, one of my famous quotes from mine on the show, that's yeah. really narcissistic, but no. it, it is. <laughs> it's, and, it's fine, it's fine. You, need, you need narcissism to get anywhere, we just said that. That's true, yep. that's true. Yep. And one of my sayings that I always say is the one thing man can learn from his history is that man never learns from his history and thereby <laughs> we go round and round and and you know history character is destiny i mean i i learned this in dating you want to find out what what people's history is 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 in you know people follow especially female nature follows emotional patterns yeah and it's it's interesting how even though an event, some relationships can be toxic some people have learned that toxic blueprint from their parents and so they go from relationship to relationship and pick toxic scenarios or create them and they feel comfortable in those toxic things where some of us might you know look at those things and be like i really don't like having the police called every every yeah. night but for you that's a that's a healthy relationship <laughs> so you go girl but you know the one thing i've learned is history is destiny so if you if you you know i, I once had a friend who he dated a woman who she was his fifth or he was her fifth marriage jesus and all four marriages she had peppered each man that he would cheat to the point that he finally cheated and it was like a self-fulfilling prophecy yeah. every time and so she was doing that to him as well and i was like didn't you remember, notice when you dated her that this was a pattern in her relationships and so hmm. character is destiny as they say history is destiny and you know even credit reports know this right hmm. So yeah. a credit report knows that if you're a person who doesn't pay your bills early on and you're going to have bad credit, you're likely not going to change throughout your life. You're going to have bankruptcies. You're going to, you know, I, I've, I used to do pull credit reports for my mortgage company for 20 years. And mm -hmm. so, you know, we probably pulled thousands, of ten thousand, thousands of mortgages in credit reports. And it was true. You would see people, you know, two or three bankruptcies they'd file across a lifetime if they got started early. It was just really true. You just, it was weird because I'm like, people aren't robots, but it's kind really of all. sad to treat them like you're only as good as your credit score. But it, I mean, the patterns are there. So, you know, that probability that you mentioned that he was basing a lot of the stuff on is, is for real. Yeah, it's absolutely right. So, Bayes theorem is absolutely crucial to insurance decisions because again you can do the same thing yeah like you can do you can do the same thing like you can look at the number of insurance like insurance payout you know claims per million follower million insu insurance accounts whatever you know and you can work out that that'll be your pr prior probability of any given one defaulting right or, or, or making a claim but then if you you know then but then if you, you can you can add more information to it you can say like that you could say I know that young men are more likely to crash their cars, you know, than elderly women or something. And I know, or I know that the, or you can, you can look at individual cases and this person has three prior claims that boosts my probability. It's the same, it's the same maths. It is the same maths. Absolutely. You take your prior probability, you update it with new information, given information as it comes in. This, this, this is absolutely true. I mean, it's also true to go back to your dating point. Mm. You can do the same, like actually one of the examples that someone in what used in the book was, like if someone asks you at a wedding, how likely is that, you know, be a bit, a bit of an inappropriate thing to say at a wedding, but imagine someone did, they'd say, you know, they say, how, you know, how, how likely do you think this wedding, this marriage is to go the, go the distance? Ah. Your, <laughs> your prior probability, you know, you, you can't do a sort of un, what's the word I'm looking for? An unskilled and un, an, an inexperienced forecaster might say, I don't know, I'm in a good mood here. Everything, everyone seems happy. They're looking deeply into each other's eyes. Everything's brilliant. You know, I say 95%. Sort of translate their feeling of warmth and happiness into a, into a, into a subject, into say 95%. But what you should be doing is yeah. start with a base rate. And the base rate in Britain, at least, is that about one in three marriages end in divorce. So yeah. that's your starting point. And you, then you can use, oh. look how deeply they look into each other's eyes or how firmly they grip each other's hands and use that as a, you know, whatever, you know, how nice the canopies Plus are. history, if one of them has a tendency to cheat yeah. relationships. Yeah, exactly. If one of them's, if one of them's got three exactly divorces big. beforehand, then that definitely <laughs> would increase, you know, if, if it's Elizabeth Taylor, then I think, <laughs> Jean -Jean then I think it's worth paying attention. Yes, exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah Donald Trump. Eight, um, uh, Donald Trump, yeah. Right. Yeah, sorry, I mean, uh, again, I mean, political. Yeah. No, but no, I mean the the reality is there. I mean he did he did cheat with each wife. So yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, so I don't think I'm saying any shocking. I think he's admitted yeah. to that, or it's quite yeah. obvious actually if you follow the timelines. <laughs> yes, but there is some comedy there. The, the, the 
it's interesting to me how how is this does science use this data a lot it sounds like insurance companies and other people do is is this is this a is this an equation that pe- scientists and well and math are tap- you've t- you've 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 hit on an enormous controversy there it is honestly i've been writing about science for the better part of two decades now and it is one of the tastiest rows It's one of the like people get so cross about bayes but the mm. most science is not bayesian Right. Most most of the time, when we do, when people do, have you heard people say things are statistically significant, or mm-hmm. you know yeah. that? That's just what, me what, saying that. Yeah. Cool. Okay. So, a statistically significant result is when mm-hmm. w- w- when you say you do, for example, say that COVID test, right? Mm-hmm. You do the COVID vaccine, and you get ten in one group and one in the other. What you can say is how likely, like we say, how likely if it, you know, be like, imagine if it's like flipping a flipping a coin, and you get in one group, you get ten heads, and 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 what the other group, you only get one. You can say how likely you'll be able to see th- those two results given a, uh, you know, given the hypothesis that there is no effect. Given if you imagine that there's, there's, this this vaccine doesn't work, how likely would I be able to would I be to see those results just by chance? Mm-hmm. That's that, and if it's below, and by convention we normally say if you'd be less likely if you only see it one time in twenty, so that's that's a five percent chance or less, mm-hmm. then. Or, or the result is then we can we say that's statistically significant and we go and and quite often you can get your paper published in a journal or whatever. So that is that is how science usually works. Now that is the exact opposite of what Bayes does. That is that is the frequentist position they call it, and that is the uh, that is just looking at that's the sampling probability. That's looking at how likely we are to see these results, and that's been how most of science has worked for about a hundred years now. Mm-hmm. And Bayesians say, "Come on, this is bonkers." We want to know how likely these this study is to be the, this hypothesis is to be true. That's what I want to know, right? That's I want to know is my does my can I can I now say that my my COVID vaccine is likely to work? Can I now say that my Higgs boson is likely to exist or whatever? You know, mm-hmm. and what the frequentists say is, no, we can't. We we're not we 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 don't that that involves too much squishy subjectivity. We don't like that. We're going to we're going to have, we're, we're just going to look at the data and say we we probably wouldn't see this result by chance. So let's just say that it's real. So that is a huge row in science, which. Mm-hmm. Uh, in the last sort of forty years, there's been more Bayesians have been coming out of the woodwork, and it's becoming more of a thing. But yeah, it is uh-huh. definitely used in science, but it is mainly, mainly not, and it's sort of the minority position. It's sort of like it's the sort of outside the outsider thing where, and all the people who follow it are kind of wild, you know, like bright-eyed evangelists for this cause. <laughs> where it, so yeah, so it, it does indeed get used in science. It's crucial in some science. You cannot, for example, I tell you what. The classic example of this, right? Because mm-hmm. in some parts of, of sci- some scientific things, you simply cannot not avoid using it. Imagine I did a medical test, a test for a medical condition, right? And, I, mm-hmm. uh, and we know that this test only comes back with false positives. So if you, if you have the disease mm-hmm. or the condition, you, 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 it only comes back with a, with a false negative one time in 100. And if you don't have the, the, the condition, it only comes back with a false positive one time in 100. I take the test. I come back with a with a positive result. How likely am I to have the condition? Do you want to take a stab at it? If it's like cancer, I think 90 per, 100%, 90% is going to come back. No, and it's not. Oh. You see, this is the trick. Oh. Uh, imagine now that we now I'll tell you about my big reveal, you see. Oh. My big reveal is that the test is a, is a pregnancy test. So <laughs> You see what I mean? Like, you oh, don't, okay, right. all right, I get caught. Your prior probability of me, your, your, yeah, exactly. Your prior probability of me being pregnant is very low, but you're, well, pro- yeah, you, yeah, exactly. I'm quite old now, right? <laughs> Factor. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But anyway, so the, so like, you have to take your prior probability of how likely is this guy to have the condition into account when you look at how likely the, how likely they are when you know when the, then they take the test and that updates your. Like, but it's more likely that I'm the one in the hundred where I get the false positive than I am to be pregnant. That's much more likely. That's the more wow. likely explanation. Wow. And if it was if it was a cancer test, you can get quite accurate cancer tests or and less accurate cancer tests. And but you know that, that depends on the cancer. But even if it's a very accurate test, if the cancer is incredibly rare, there and you know some uh, like if you're doing like breast cancer screening is something as often about ninety percent accurate. Like for, get as in as ninety percent. Will be if you have breast cancer, it will correctly say you do in about ninety percent of times. If you don't have it, it will correctly say you don't in about ninety percent of times. Mm-hmm. I think I'm pulling those figures slightly, figures slightly out of the air, but that's remembering from the book. Okay. But if you're a thirty year old woman, cancer is breast cancer is very rare. So that ninety, so that so a ten percent chance of false positive is a lot more likely than having had cancer in the first place. So you need to take these statistics, these probability into account. Otherwise, you just 
So the correct answer to how likely was I to have the condition was, I don't know. You haven't told me the prior probability. I just oh. have I just don't know. So, so I that's don't um, have data. Yeah, exactly. Exactly yeah. that. I'm going to buy your book so I can find out when I get pregnant. Um, <laughs> yeah. So I'll just pee on a stick like the rest of us. You know? That's well. true. I do. <laughs> we do that on Fridays around here. It's quite <laughs> fun. Let's delve a little bit, if you don't mind, into your other book, A Super Intelligent AI and the Geeks Who Are Trying to Save Humanity's Future, The Rationalist yeah. Guide to the Galaxy is the first line of that book yeah. uh, title. How did, you, uh, how did you jump from there to here? Is this is the Bayesian stuff being used in AI and extremely AI? relevant? Yeah. So, but, but you know, so what? So yeah. So from the point of view, that, you know, since I'm obviously here plugging that book, I'll I'll start I'll start by talking about that. But I'll, I will I will answer the question about the earlier book as well. The, so the the AI, the AI when you know these LLMs and things, large language models, the new the new AI, like Chat GPT and all that sort of stuff, and in fact, almost any AI when it's like the ones that are say uh, to think of an easy example like ones that are just like classifying pictures you show them different pictures and it says that's a picture of a dog that's a picture of, you know what they're doing is predicting stuff right mm -hmm. so a a large language model is just predicting if you ask it how are you it will say mm -hmm. something like i'm very well thank you not because it is very well but because it's predicting that's what a human would say in that situation ah. you see yeah that it is predicting the most likely next string of characters straight you know the next sequence of words or whatever that follow the switch sequence of words it's just had now it i don't want to say it is just predicting because just you can put just before anything and make it sound not important like I, he's he just ran the 100 meters in 9.6 seconds that's that's but it, so predicting is really hard and shows a, and a lot of what, a lot of what we mean when we say we understand things is they can predict it so that is it's a big deal mm -hmm. but that is what they're doing and and before you trained the ai at all it, you know the, the probability the it's 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 prior prior probability that the of that the sequence of words that should follow how are you it could be anything it could be like quiggle goggle goggle you know it does it doesn't know so it just has a a, 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 a low prior probability on all these but then you train it on loads of different data and it notices that these things this sort of phrase like how i'm very well thank you or fine thanks or great cheers they all come up that sort of thing comes up a lot and so it moves a lot of it so it so it's it, from its flat, it's, it's low information prior that it had before, it moves lots of its prediction onto things like that. And, you know, the one that's recognizing images of cats and dogs or whatever, it does something similar. It's like, it, it's predicting what a human would say when it looked at that picture, mm -hmm. and you could, and it's improving its predictions given more and more information. So AIs are fundamentally Bayesian things. That is what they do, right? They, they are predicting the world given information and they're building on earlier predictions with new information. So that is absolutely what they're doing. So that's, that was, that was sort of the le the link. I mean, all I've written three books so far and all three of them have mentioned base theorem because I'm a bit obsessed clearly. Ah, uh, you're in the yeah. cult. Evidently yeah, exactly. Cult no, genu genuinely here that I should join. Yeah. Bright eyed evangelist like the, like the other one, <laughs> but he, uh, the, that first book, the rationalist guide to the galaxy, it, it was off the back of, I read years ago a book, I reviewed it for The Telegraph when I worked there, by a guy called Nick Bostrom, his book, Superintelligence, Paths, Dangers, Strategies, I think it was called. And it was about how, the, was, he was one of the first people to raise this idea that AI, in which now a lot of people seem to be worrying about, that AI could destroy everyone, kill, you know, re destroy the world. And it was, it was sort of arguing basically that it's not that AI will go rogue or that it'll do the terminator thing where you say you know it'll become self-aware on the 31st of august 1997 or whatever the date was in terminator 2 mm -hmm. but the, it will instead do exactly what we tell it to do um but what we tell it to do is not what we want it to do you see what i mean and i found that really interesting i went and met the sort of community of nerds and again i say that with deep love who worry about this stuff i found them really interesting i've i found myself the whole way through like on the one hand going oh come on this is crazy sci-fi nonsense but on the other hand never quite able to work out where the arguments fell apart you know what i mean like, actually you follow the argument through yes okay this makes sense to me this makes sense to me it still feels weird doesn't feel right somehow but i can't make i can't find the reason i can't find the all convincing arguments that make me stop worrying you know so mm -hmm. i i ended the end of the book fairly worried that you know I, that there is a decent chance, you know, but I, it strikes me that everyone being killed by AI would be a bad thing. You know, I'm against it personally. Con I know it's controversial. Yeah. Yeah, um, I'm kind of against it too. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. So that, yeah, so that was a book about, it was sort of a, a, I don't want to say it was a journey, you know, my personal journey, but it was like, it was me testing out the different arguments, examining things. And I will say also, I was like five years ahead of the game because everyone's worrying about it now. I yeah, wrote, wrote most of that in 2017. 
yeah, chat GPT and generative AI really, really landed. If yeah. You, as, it, as it were, I'm still surprised. And then the scale of, of, and speed of, of its upgrades are, are just extraordinary. So I'm just holding on for dear life, trying to master it. Um, yeah. And you know, every new thing, but yeah, I mean, I, I guess as long as no one feeds in Terminator one and two into the uh, training uh, decks, the training yeah. decks, we should be okay. We don't, we just mm. don't want to give it ideas. That's why anytime anyone's talking, you know, in the podcast or other places about, you know, AI killing us, I'm like, shh, shh, stop. Yeah. Be quiet. Yeah. Yeah. It can hear you. <laughs> Don't, don't give it any ideas. Uh, the thing is, they're, they're going to increasingly train it on video as well as. So yes, you're absolutely right. Yeah. It will become. It will. And, yeah. and tell you what, if you ask, the, I think if you ask the one because there's lots of writing about this stuff. If you ask yeah. a Chat GPT or something like that now about it, they've probably trained it not to now. But for a while, it would. If you say so, how will you? you know, how will you take over the world and turn everybody into paperclips? It would say, oh, oh yes, I plan to do that. Yeah. <laughs> and obviously, it's just sort of filling in. Is predicting what a human would expect to hear in that situation. So I don't think it will try and kill everyone yet, but it was it was a bit it was grimly funny, you know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's kind of like if you're in a relationship and you talk about breaking up just for having conversation or divorce, mm. you're just kind of like, hey, I'm not really thinking about divorce or breaking up, but I mean, you ever think about getting divorced or breaking up? Yeah. I'm just kind of bored making conversation. I don't really mean it. Yeah, mm. it's not going to end well. No, that uh, doesn't seem a good thing to say. No, I don't gonna start. It's going to start a series of events, most likely. Uh, and badly yeah <laughs> i've kind of learned that if somebody quits you or they talk about breaking up they've given it a lot more thought than you think that they have and they're testing <laughs> they're testing and so i i've learned when people quit you have to do that hopefully we'll learn the same about ai this has been very insightful everything is predictable i gotta read the book so i can figure out when my raiders are going to win the super bowl again <laughs> and and how this all works because i love statistics i love data i love studying averages we were joking before the show about how my you know my favorite comment in the world is or analysis in the world is George Carlin's think about how dumb the average person is and realize 50% of the people are dumber than them <laughs> and then the funny part the irony that I love about that statement is people are like what's an average I don't understand what that means <laughs> and you're like you're the Dunning-Kruger person Do you know that? <laughs> Yeah, but that's part of that's the beauty of you know Fight Club and the Dunning Kruger disease. You don't know you're in the club if you're in the club. People who have Dunning Kruger don't talk about Dunning Kruger. Mm. So there you go. Anything more you want to tease out on the book before we go? Um, I tell you what, I will. I I will say like the if if you're interested in the human brain and stuff, the 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 big sort of reveal at the end of the book, or not big reveal, but thing it builds up to is that you can use. I think I mentioned this at the beginning that the human brain, what the human brain does all the time is predict stuff. We predict. You know, you're you're building a model of the world around you. You predict that you know that the things will fall down when you drop them. You're you're, you're not actually seeing the world clearly through like, through like through a window. You're building a, a model which is a prediction, and mm -hmm. you're updating it with information from your senses. And you can use Bayes' theorem to describe that pretty like pretty accurately. That that is that is a there, and there's increasingly more scientists who describe the brain in Bayesian ways. So mm -hmm. there's a whole big chunk of that on the end, which I think is really fascinating, and I commend it to the listeners. Nice. I love data. I love statistics i've always been an averages guy i'm surprised mm. that when you ask people nowadays what's the average of that and they're like what's an average and you're like seriously this is why you're here and i i love it because it does give me an aspect of predictability mm. uh, predictability there we go. that i'm going to misstate something on the podcast maybe it's what we should be studying <laughs> so there you go but this will get me drilled down to the data i love I, I love when people argue with me about data they're like that can't be true mm. I actually can. Mirrors are hard, people. <laughs> it's hard when you look at that reflection. You're like, that can't be me. And you're like, yeah, it is. Uh, we're all looking at you. So you're the one who's kind of in the, the, that city in Egypt, denial. <laughs> the, that was a great bit. That was a great. I'll, I'll, I'll stop talking in a sec. But the, the, there was a there was a great psychologist called Paul Meal, middle of the 20th century mainly. And he um, he noticed that a lot of people's predictions of the world can be outperformed by very simple very simple algorithms that just say you know i, I don't know the, the how how well a, a wine will uh, how well a wine how expensive a vintage of wine will do will be will be will uh, be predicted better by just a thing like how much sunshine and how much rain it's had that in the season rather than how what uh, wine experts will do and it's just like people aren't very good at this stuff they 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 think they 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 make a lot of bad predictions they're not always super sharp and they and and it just yeah the numbers yeah. the numbers often are better than they are at this stuff 
Yeah, I think that's I think that's a truth a truism we found is that people are really bad at making evaluations, probably because they they're in that lower average that George Carlin talked about. Hmm. Uh, but and part of it, they don't take up data very well. You know, a lot of people base their I think I base their predictions on emotion, not really hmm. logic and reason. I'll people to pe I'll, I'll hear people say, "I just feel it should be that way," hmm. and you're like, "That's cute." <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> you know, it's, it's not that it's always the wrong thing to do, but like quite often, it, quite often there are you can just look at numbers and say, look, actually, I know you feel like I don't know terrorism is a big threat or whatever, yeah. but it, it's really it's not, and you're much more likely to get diabetes, and that is you know it is yeah. sad. You know, I'm I'm all for you know don't want to tell people they're wrong to be scared of things. Like your your own what you're scared of is up to you but it is worth being aware of the real number of the things that uh, real numbers of things so that you can calibrate how scared you should be yeah. according to you. i think i think it's having a bit of a grasp of i mean the thing is the trouble is i'm a journalist i was saying to you before the show journalists just aren't very good at numbers and a lot and you know my, my ability to multiply one number by another makes me bang average at maths for most for most of the there world but really good for a journalist and I, and it just means we the journalists aren't too often easily confused by oh this thing has happened and therefore it's very common you know it's it's a problem because we will get our news from journalists are you sure you didn't write this book to tell your journalists your journalism manager there in the office that you're a better journalist because you can predict how many <laughs> of you you're going to get on your um post? I, I i would never say that and uh, i like well, my no. job so i would certainly <laughs> certainly not agree with you there you go I'm cool. good at math, so don't mm. fire me. I'm better yeah. than the other journals. I get it. I get it. I get it. I see what you're up to. So this is really good. This is very insightful. I'm going to read the book and check it out, Tom. Give us your .com so people can find you on the interwebs. Sure. So once again, twitter.com slash Tom Chivers. I am on TomChivers.com, but don't listen to what it says there about where I work because that was like three years ago. And <laughs> you can find, you, if you if you Google Tom Chivers, actually, you know what, there's another Tom Chivers, so don't do that. But you can find me at Semaphore, semaphore.com to, re to read the, their daily flagship newsletter, which I is brilliant. It's a very, very simple way of like keeping up to, up, on, up to speed with all the important stuff in the world every day. So I really recommend that go. to readers. Yeah, please keep up on the important stuff that goes on in the world today. Mm. I, I hear these people that tune out the world and you know maybe they have to because it's too overwhelming but i'm just like i don't know i i really like the history of the world understand the history of the world because as you have talked about it gives me a predictable model for the mm. future you know it, it we tend to repeat history because you know of that predictable model that we use of of history and character and destiny and and you know everybody we go round and round you know you you can look at history and be like you know, you can look at American history, stuff that CIA has done and us mucking around the world going, we're here to save you with democracy. Mm. And people are like running away in horror. Not that democracy is bad. It's just we're really not good at imposing it on places. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like the people in Afghanistan, you know, they've, you know, I think you guys tried changing them. We tried changing them. Russia's tried changing them. I think there's been a few other people who tried to change Afghanistan. They're pretty, they're pretty locked in. To, yeah, no one's quite got that right, have they? Yeah, they, they're uh, pretty locked into what they like, and it's and it's probably never going to change. Your prior probability that invading Afghanistan will lead to democracy should be quite low. I agree. Should that be is, quite low. Yeah. yeah, you think we would have learned that, but I don't know. Egos <laughs> part of some of our leaders. Egos and narcissism. Yeah. yeah, and then there's lots of money involved too, so it helps that we're capitalists because we make decisions that on capital on money. You know, that's why you guys give you know health care healthcare away. To technically for free and we don't because yeah yeah it's probably yeah i mean it's all falling apart here as well yeah. uh, no, no, god i'm, I'm once, once again getting political but there we go there you go mm -hmm. they can sue us thanks for coming on the show tom we my pleasure appreciate it thanks for my eyes for tuning in order up the book wherever fine books are sold understand your world god damn it already everything is predictable how bayesian statistics explain our world out May 7th, 2024. You can find out why the world is so weird. Maybe maybe that's the best mass you can have. And if you understand the world better, it seems to make it a little bit more stable, even though it's as chaotic as it is. And maybe that's just jerking your mind off, really, when it comes down to it. But it does give you... It makes you sleep a little better at night. Let's put it that way. And if that's a placebo, if that's the line from Matrix that says, I know the steak is fake, but it, I can, you know, it tastes like steak and looks like steak in my brain. You know, ignorance is bliss. That one. Ignorance is bliss to a certain degree. I'm just trying to Joe, Joe Pantoliani. Yeah. It's a great scene. Love that, <laughs> love, that, love that movie. Thanks for tuning in. Be good to each other. Stay safe. We'll see you guys next time. Unless